Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, the night no one comes home. Well, sir, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today about Halloween 3 and all things Halloween 3. Mm-hmm. I, um, as you can tell, I'm a fan and uh, a lot of us are. And I've just got so many questions for you. But um, first off, I, I know you've probably talked about this before, but I'm just curious. Can you talk about the challenge of doing something daringly different when it comes to a franchise like Halloween and um, pinning the script and directing it and taking it in that direction um, from and, and, you know, working with John on creating this new entry? Uh, it was a good challenge for me. I, I, uh, you probably know that, uh, I was briefly, uh, on Halloween two as the director. Mm -hmm. I dropped out when the script came in and I just didn't like it at all and felt that it, uh, it just wasn't a good way to start my directing career in my, in my view. So, uh, I set that out, but luckily uh, John and Deborah turned to me again on Halloween 3, and it seemed like a great possibility to just, you know, Halloween is a big subject, and uh, the uh, as, as amazing as the original Halloween was, and it's a movie I'm very proud of, uh, it wasn't all that much about Halloween itself. It was about babysitting, <laughs> and uh, no, that's the truth, that the yeah. original the, the original title was the babysitter murders. So the Halloween idea was kind of plugged into it and it was effective and uh, clever and all that, but it was by no means the final statement about Halloween, the season or the, uh, you know, the celebration, or I suppose one day it'll become a national holiday. If the trend keeps, <laughs> keeps going, cause people just seem to love Halloween, you know, the, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm looking at it. Um, but anyway, yeah, it was a it was a a lovely challenge, and I think that we would have succeeded had there not been a precedent setting Roman numeral two. When you do a pattern where okay, Halloween came, and then there was Halloween Roman numeral two, and now here's Halloween with a Roman numeral three, you got to assume that's a sequel. Where's Michael Myers? Where's the big knife? And that was our problem. We didn't set the table properly. Universal didn't advertise it to set the table to say, hey, this is going to be a totally different thing. I think we could have gotten our audience to go along with it, but we didn't set the table properly. And hence the uh, the title, the subtitle of my book, Halloween 3, Where the Hell's Michael Myers? <laughs> Um, which is a great title by the way (laughs) thank you thank you and and it it was true uh there's a a colleague of mine did a uh an introduction to the book tom atkins did the original introduction and then there's another what i call it dispatch from an original fan guy named uh harrison bruce harrison smith uh and he recounts the experience of sitting in the theater upon Halloween 3's release. And he noticed 10 minutes into the movie, the mumblings started going, what the hell is it? Where's Michael Myers? Where the hell am I going? I want my money back. The, the backlash was pretty tremendous. And it has taken many years for it to find its true audience and to, well, redemption is sweet. You know, it's got so many fans and I've got a pile of, show and tell for you of the latest, <laughs> the latest bunch of memorabilia. It's just uh, awe-inspiring and uh, it, of course, feels really good that well, it's gotten um, this place. Well, one thing I wanted to ask about too was in terms of, you'd, you'd mentioned the studio not marketing it properly and it didn't. Uh, it kind of just, uh, from what I gathered and, and researching and, and everything I've seen, they kind of just part of the thing was they didn't like the fact that you had this not a winning ending for <laughs> the good guys. And yeah, there's uh, a- they kind of were like, well, you know, and you had gone to John and said, they're pushing back on this. And he basically told you it's your, it's your damn movie. You get yeah, to which, 
which that alone is astonishing. John, in effect, gave me final cut my first time out as a director. He gave me what he had insisted on in his career up to that point, which was, hey, the director is the guy. The director is going to decide. And he gave me that privilege, which was astonishing, very courageous. I made a courageous decision to stay with the ending I wanted. And John made an even more courageous decision to back me. Uh, and so we have the movie we have. Uh, I must say it's a tribute to the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the oh, yeah. 1956 Don Siegel version, because they had the same idea. And the ending was supposed to be Kevin McCarthy raving into the camera you're next, you're next, cut to black, go to credits. And the studio wouldn't let him do it. So this time we got our way and it was basically a tribute to Don Siegel. I also want to note that not to diss Universal and their advertising department too much because the poster oh, it's and, and the promo was was gorgeous. It's it's just, yeah, <laughs> wow, look at that. <laughs> There's a little story behind the uh, image of the three trick-or-treaters, too. I'll tell you that in a second. But fabulous, except that it didn't allude to what it really was. It There was a little banner way up in the corner that said, all new. What does that mean? You know, all new what? Uh, we needed more than that to prepare the audience for something that truly was all new. Um the the thing about that little image you're wearing, uh, those three trick or treaters, that's a frame grab from the movie. But what makes it eerie is the movie was shot anamorphic. Uh, you, I don't know. Some of your fans will know what that means. Right. The lenses squeeze the image uh, into a 35 millimeter frame, but then the projection lens unsqueezes it so that it's a true widescreen image so in the cutting room i was looking at that image of those trick-or-treaters on 35 millimeter film and it squeezed and i said oh that's so eerie let's use it like that yeah. let's unsqueeze it let's make it long and eerie and that's how it came to be it's basically the same story as uh the beatles image on the rubber soul album if you look at it, they're kind of squeezed. And the same thing happened. They saw an, a, a squeezed version and thought, wow, that's eerie. It's kind of, well, it's rubbery, isn't it? And uh, that's how that came to be. Well, I, and I got way off track. I don't know. No, it's, no, it's, no, that, that completely, that, that answers it. Like in terms of one thing that I, um, I, I, caught up on you know that stuck out to me because i grew up in in the time like i was a kid when this movie came out um was this came out right after you 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 nailed it when it came to kids in terror and kids in um uh danger because at the time this movie came out like right after right before it that was when the big uh melt cartons having kids faces on them started yeah. and and you you had more uh stories about things like adam walsh and and stuff like this where kids were in 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 danger yeah. and least, you're they, you, they you may all, they may have always been but it was being publicized right and i must say probably cynically so to crank up business for one thing or another as well so that was piled on top of the thing so it felt like a crisis right and and this movie uh kind of you you broke the rule where kids were supposed to be safe in movies <laughs> like you you broke that rule and and it was fantastic how you did it and that was the whole point like we're sacrificing the kids you know this is this is a thing yeah, but on serious business yeah and on top of that um the same year the movie came out you time it i it sort of oddly timed in that people were getting killed by things they were buying at the store with the Tylenol poisoning, like yeah. literally that year. And it, it, it was interesting. I'm like, wasn't that all going on at the same time? Wow. What a perfect storm. And it, it also affected Halloween at that time because people were scared of the candy again. Razor blades in the apples. That was an urban myth uh, that 
was was it caught on. People were terrified. Well, and also cyan, that cyanide poisoning, people were not wanting their kids to go trick or treating because of that. And so you kind of nailed it at, at with this perfect meshing of that. Can you did anything like that influence the film itself for you? It was just in the it it was in the air. Uh, we didn't sit down and say, oh, this theme, we really need to emphasize this theme. None of that. It was just instinctive. Uh, there's a through line about children. Uh, if you go back to John's second feature, Assault on Precinct 13, we did a very daring thing in that movie. Uh, we killed a child. Uh, a famous scene, really effective scene about a little girl getting shot by mistake as it were uh from a gang member but it's right there and it triggers the entire plot and the the holding up of the group in the police station and all the rest uh and then of course halloween three and then a couple of years later a few years later i guess eight years later i wound up directing stephen king's it which is all about kids in danger kids in jeopardy kids the the rites of passage of kids being frightened by monsters or something much more tangible than a monster but adults evil adults right you know? so that's a through line and uh, we certainly uh that was nigel neal's uh writing that brought us the the central plot of halloween three the just the jeopardy of the children that's a big uh that's a big deal totally is and the other part of that i wanted to touch on just to me as i i've watched this a few times recently again was the fact that you you brought a visible the the visuals and the the feel of this movie feels like a classic british almost cult film you know like <laughs> that that unnerving feeling that you've brought across it and like it could have been around the time of the wicker man in terms of how it just is just creepy unnerving quiet and these you know there's something ominous about santa mira it was the uh the greatest strength and the greatest weakness of nigel neal's original script it had that eerie quality that he had proven so good at as a uh, an innovator in British television in the 50s so it carried that notion along but it had it was almost a museum piece in a way because it it was not showing any consciousness to speak of of the world of 1982 and the horror movie fan fandom that was growing up around the phenomenon basically halloween kicked it off and then a gob of other movies followed <laughs> friday the 13th and so on uh that part nigel had no real consciousness about but you've nailed one of the most charming and strange aspects of his original script was it was it felt like a british psychodrama from the 50s uh the way he wrote it and john and i both each did a rewrite to try and uh, not lose that quality, but yet bring the whole thing into the uh, 80s, if you will, in the U.S. Because that but, was our first audience. It, well, and you did an amazing job with it. And the other part that I, I thought was interesting, and this actually goes back to the whole 80s uh, time frame, was your meshing of sci-fi and a horror in a in a really unique way because at that time uh you know tech was coming into play in a lot of ways and you know the 80s are unique because of that whole uh just the bur the just the bursting out of of technology at that time and how you took ancient like paganism and then brought that technical aspect into it it just made sense well deborah hill famously at that time was uh coming up with good uh, uh hollywood runs on the elevator pitch uh if you've got a bumper sticker idea or a a, a pitch that you can bring off in a, a sentence or two while you're riding in the elevator uh, you're going to get somewhere because well 
<laughs> among other things, everybody there has an attention span of a fruit fly, you know. <laughs> so, and her pitch, I believe it was Deborah's, uh, uh, when the idea popped up that, hey, let's do something different. Her pitch was uh, witchcraft meets the computer age. That was the whole thing. And uh, it grew out of that. Well, and that's it, it's fantastic. And um, I wanted to ask you brought you brought up Deborah, and she's uh, one of my heroes. And I was just wanting to ask you about working with her throughout all the films that you did with her. Can you give some some you know memories about working with her? Deborah was a force of nature. Uh, we first met on Assault on Precinct Thirteen. She was uh, the script supervisor. And then in post-production, uh, she became a kind of quasi-assistant editor because she would, uh, basically, this is a little rascals making a movie, so it wasn't a conventional crew by any means. And in post-production, John was editing his own footage in lieu of being able to hire a full-time editor. And uh, Deborah was coming through every few days and filing trims he would fill up these trim bins this was all on film of course right uh he would fill up these trim bins and then deborah would come by and file them and even then she was well two things were happening at once she was ambitious and she wanted to move up the ladder and she and john uh became intimate uh and became a couple uh so then along came Halloween, and lo and behold, it was announced that Deborah would be producing. <clears throat> well, to the outsider looking in, it could have seemed like just the ultimate Hollywood nepotism. It's like, oh, wait, the director's girlfriend is going to produce. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, it It didn't sound too good, but then that would be because one didn't know Deborah. Right. The fact is that she was very forceful, very smart, very hardworking. And lo and behold, on Halloween, she turned out to be an excellent producer, just the, couldn't have had a better choice. And moreover, she uh, had worked a long string of super low budget movies uh, with several people who became instrumental in Halloween, that being uh, Don Barron's on the, uh, production office side he was the production manager and dean cundy and crew the director of photography on the uh, picture side of things uh so she brought along a seasoned crew ready to do something good and john brought to the table himself and me and uh, a couple other people uh and it turned out to just be a, a a dream experience we didn't have much money but we were good. We were just good. And it shows, you know, John was, okay. <laughs> as a director, he was hitting his stride, finding his own style, very confident. He ran a good set, uh, friendly and fun, but let's get it done. Uh, so, you know, lightning in a bottle is what happened then. It's amazing. Well, and I wanted to talk to you about um, basically the the it's sneak there are some sneaky things that you did within Halloween three talking about Michael Myers that um I caught one thing of and I'm gonna ask if you can confirm this is true or not. Is it in fact a Michael Myers mask at the very tell end seconds of the first airing of the the uh, Silver Shamrock commercial that shows up on screen? Gosh. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. Maybe somebody <laughs> snuck it in there, but it wasn't on purpose. I, I was conscious. We needed a a, a scary movie for our little horror thon that yeah. was taking place, and in fact, it was sort of serendipity that it turned out to be Halloween. Uh, it's it now seems entirely appropriate and sort of insidey and clever and fun, but in fact, it was one movie that we didn't have to think twice about getting the rights to. 
It was John's movie. Right. John was the producer of this movie. So there wasn't going to be a lot of argument about us having the right to use it in the movie. That's how that came about. But looking back on it, you know, there is Jamie Lee briefly. There is the shape wandering around with the knife. So I love that we included <laughs> the original Halloween in our movie. Uh, in that way, it uh, it did sort of uh, allude to true sequel status, even though it wasn't at all a sequel. Well, I was curious, too, what you thought of the fan theory that um, in Halloween 1 and 2, uh, and possibly the, the, the following films, that Michael Myers was actually a silver shamrock killer robot. And that's why he <laughs> kept coming back. <laughs> That's uh, some, you know, <laughs> there are a lot of wild stories that fans dream up and, you know, more power to them. But <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't come up with that. Uh, <laughs> well, and so uh, one thing I, I wanted to ask about as well was the guy I'm wearing on my shirt, um, Mr. Tom Atkins. Yeah. And, and Dan O'Herlihy, who I call him the techno pagan in this. Yeah, that's good. I, like I, I I love both of them. Um, Dan O'Hurley, he just he kind of had a renaissance in his in the eighties as in in RoboCop and this, and then somehow they talked him into wearing all of that makeup in the Last Starfighter. Um, and I just was curious if you could talk about uh working with him in this as well as Tom Atkins is that perfect kind of broken hero that he played in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I loved Tom in the role because it was unexpected. The thing that you see, not just in Hollywood, but in a lot of independent films, too, is that, okay, we need a leading man. So let's get this average kind of cute looking white guy who's about 23 to play the part. And so often it just goes it just blands out. It's so vanilla. It's just vanilla to the point of being like, will these people get a clue and cast something interesting, someone interesting of any color, of any <laughs> shape, yep. of any size? You know, it, it just, you know, any, anybody. So the, the idea when Annette was again, it was Deborah's idea, I think. Uh, how about Tom? Because I'd worked with him on the fog. Uh, we were running in the same social circles. Our mutual friend was Adrienne Barbeau. Uh, so we were familiar with each other and uh, couldn't say we were friends, but I knew of him. And so when Deborah mentioned him, he went right to the top of the list. You know, there's always a list. Uh, and he went right to the top. Uh and I think this idea, as you put it, you know, a, a damaged, flawed hero, if not a downright anti-hero, uh, fits. It fits the movie. It's it's textured and different. He's not young by any means, and he's not cute. No, you know? I, I, I may have to beg to differ there. <laughs> well, he, I, I think he's a really rugged, handsome guy, but that that cuddly, cute little ingenue boy kind of oh, no. star that Hollywood loves so much. He ain't <laughs> that. And, uh, I, I celebrate that. Uh, Dan, uh, you know, you couldn't ask for a better villain than Dan O'Hurley. However, he was not the first choice. Uh, you may be too young to remember, but uh, I went after Fred McMurray. Oh that, wow! I did not uh, know yeah. that. That's different. Wow. Think about think about him in that role because most people, if they remember Fred McMurray at all, they're thinking of this avuncular guy with a pipe standing in the corner of My Three Sons right. TV show, offering fatherly advice to these uh, vexing teenagers and young people that he's got in under his roof. Or he's the absent-minded professor, you know, always this sort of soft role of niceness. But that means they haven't seen him in double indemnity right. against Barbara 
Stanwick, uh, when he was the, the evilest of guys. And he played it so well because he seems like a nice guy. He would have been he would have been really good in the role, but in in a way, I'm glad he didn't do it because uh, I think Dan, in the end, is 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 even better than than Fred could ever have been. So, oh, but, he he just did it. He just he he was so Irish. Yeah, and it and it came. Well, he comes. He comes by right. that honestly. He's yeah. He is Irish. Yeah, and it just it it made it so much sweeter in a way that he was. Well, so, there's, there's so, affection there, and and also remember, good villains don't think they're evil. They he wasn't trying to hurt children. That was not his goal. He had a much bigger sort of tribal imperative. He says it. You know, it's time again. It's. This is this is not personal. I'm not just trying to hurt children. We have to do this. We just to keep the planets in alignment, just to keep things in balance. It's time for a major sacrifice here. Yeah. Uh, that made it chilling because it's like, wait, he maybe he's right. You know. Well, that, and, and, and anytime of, there's like a belief system behind it, yeah, it's even more terrifying. It's like oh, they don't care. They're or, just going to do it. That's, right. <laughs> yeah, this is not a good and evil kind of thing. This is what I need to do, you know? <laughs> right. Well, and one thing I wanted to um, to talk to you about was what's on your hat, which is the masks and the entire just, I, I love the images that you created. I love those masks so much. They are iconic now. They're showing up in other films. <laughs> Here's the latest little bit of, Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's a a, a briefcase. Oh, that is amazing. Does it play the song? Because that would oh, be. I, I wish it does. <laughs> but, I mean, really, look at this. Is that not cool? Oh my god, that is so that, neat. Yeah. Oh, and there's its little junior partner is a billfold. Oh my god! Oh, it's the TV. <laughs> it's the, well, the TV with the snaps and everything. Oh, that is so great. Silver they're, Shamrock on the back. They're going to take my money again. <laughs> yeah, this is Trick or Treat Studios. You oh, that's amazing. Are well acquainted. Is that cool? That, that is so neat. Unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah, oh, I've got, I, I have their, um, their, uh, Judith Myers tombstone backpack. The, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But now I have to get that. Great. I remember well when we created that tombstone, a big slab of styrofoam, and Randy Moore, was a colleague in the art department. He and I laid it out. Randy and I were both adept with the exacto knife, and you, uh, <clears throat> you know, just carved carved into the styrofoam. That's and then it, I had learned on the Assault on Precinct Thirteen what you can do with styrofoam if you dab it with a little bit of uh, diluted lacquer thinner. It eats into it, but not very much, so it becomes very convincing as a piece of granite. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I think that's... Randy, I, I haven't been in touch with him, but I think he recently sold that to a collector. Oh, they wow. Were... I bet. Yeah, I bet they made some money on that one. But since but... we're doing show and tell, check uh... it out. This is, you know, this one. Oh, it's the sign. Um, final processing. <laughs> and they came up with this was this was the only one I've seen, only piece of memorabilia I've seen that I really wanted from the get go. It's like, who would have thought a Ouija board, a Halloween three Ouija board? Oh my gosh! Does it have the max? Oh, that's so neat! Yeah, it's unbelievable. That just goes on and on. Okay, but we were talking about masks. We were talking about the masks, and I was wanting to talk about uh, Don that Post and Bo oh Jesus, they have wrapping paper. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, they've started selling the big knife. Oh, this, good lord! This, <laughs> is, this is a little less disturbing because it's a piece of wood and it's not sharp, or maybe it's plastic. I've seen know. the I've seen the real ones show up at the shows to get signed, though. Those are a little creepy when somebody walks up with an authentic sharp butcher knife, and it's like, Ooh. yeah, yeah, you get, you get a little icky. Good, good thing the prop wasn't a gun. <laughs> Like, shit. <laughs> oh man that yeah that would have I, been awkward i guess i've run through all of the oh a fan sent me this 
This is uh, a little stand. Oh. And a little buddy. Oh, a little buddy getting ready to push and, out. <laughs> right. And it, it stands on the stand. Ah, oh, that's so cute. Oh, oh it hurts. <laughs> it hurts. I, I honestly, I've got the, uh, I bought the, the three, uh, three doll pack that came with the t shirt or the, the TV <laughs> that I really I want to get. It's, it's in my, my closet, but I really want to get like a soundboard of the, the, the commercial to put oh. in there to hit the button. <laughs> of trick, or, trick or treat studios now sells. It's the only thing I make a little bit of money on of all of this memorabilia stuff. It's a big plastic pumpkin. And you push a button and it plays don't 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 eight more days to Halloween. Oh my god, now I have to buy that. Pick up on one of those. (laughs) Puts a a penny or a nickel in my pocket. (laughs) Well, I was I wanted to talk about the masks because they become uh they become such an iconic thing now. How does it feel to see that part of it and just the entire love of the movie? become this now like so many years later and it just keeps growing it's it's a mixed feeling of course i'm gratified and proud and happy that it's all come out this way i'd feel even better if i was making a little bit of money on all of that <laughs> of course uh, it's like there so you can see it's some mixed feelings there uh it would be nice to be getting rich on all this stuff but that's okay it's it's one thing it's just really beautiful that the movie has been redeemed and has found its audience and uh there are very few naysayers anymore uh who say oh halloween three blah you know it's the opposite these yeah. days anyway yeah. about the masks uh my interest in and fascination with masks goes all the way back to film school when i made a uh a student film eight millimeter student film called killer clown about an ordinary guy who wears a clown mask all the time. And that, that set me on the road, I guess. And of course, with Halloween, I originated the, uh, I adapted the, uh, the Captain Kirk mask into what we called the shape, the script called it the shape. And, uh, everybody just come to call him. Are you Michael Myers? You know, walk (laughs) up to my table. Are you, (laughs) Somebody at the last show walked up to me and says, are you Halloween? <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Except yes. Say, oh, I'm, Tommy. <laughs> I'm Tommy Wallace. <laughs> um, it's, it's like that line from Ghostbusters. Are you a God? Well, you always say yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, I think that's the best answer is just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, after the experience with the, uh, with the shape mask, uh, I was primed and ready uh, <clears throat> for uh, what was coming. Nigel's script did not go to any detail about the masks, just that there were three masks <clears throat> that were celebrating the, the season. So uh, in the meantime, after Halloween, where the masks were all made by me, I, there were three or four or maybe even five of them, but I made them all. Then on Halloween 2, they called me several times to find out the finer points of how to do that. But Deborah also went to Don Post, who had made the original Captain Kirk mask, right. and asked him if he would do <clears throat> a, a series of shape masks for the movie, which he did. Uh, I, I talked to him on the phone and in texting uh he he doesn't know nor do i know nor do any of the fans know precisely which scenes used my masks versus which scenes used the don post uh manufactured masks they do look from scene to scene a little different because i think don post used a thicker latex on the masks the custom masks he made than the original Kirk masks were. The Kirk masks were very thin latex. And uh, if there is one left anywhere out there, it's bound to be turning to dust by now. Um, But uh, Don, uh, Deborah was very clever producer. She is definitely worthy of your admiration as a 
just a go-getting kind of producer. She was very determined to bring all the money to the screen and uh, not waste any. And so she worked out a deal with Don that whatever masks we could come up with, he would give us for free and let us use his facilities and even photograph the facilities, which wound up in the movie, uh, in exchange for him retaining the rights to the mask. That, that's a real coup, just a clever producing coup. She saved money. It was a win-win for Don. Uh, and that's just an example of how she operated. We didn't have uh, the wherewithal. We, we needed to work off the shelf if we could. And as it happens, the skull mask had been in existence for several years. It was available at that time in uh, pink and kind of greenish and white. All three glowed in the dark. Uh, and so as soon as I saw the skull on the shelf, I said, okay, that's one of them right there. <laughs> you don't have to think. That's going to be one of them. As it happened, Don had already been thinking about expanding his line, and he had kind of on tap, one of his sculptors was coming up with a witch that was very convincing. I was looking at rough versions of it and saying, yep. Uh, <laughs> Number two. <laughs> they glow green, please. You know, really, really vivid, ugly green. That's number two. What's left? Well, just purely as a designer, I felt like we needed something from the other side of the color wheel. And about at the same time in my head, it was like, what's the next obvious iconic image of Halloween? Jack-o'-lantern, of course. And so we actually, I think I sketched out just the kind of jack-o'-lantern I'd been carving since I was a little kid. You know, triangle eyes, triangle nose, jaggedy smile. Uh, and so they went to work on that. That was the only one that we specifically designed and manufactured for the movie, but that's where the three came from. I, I love, I just love it because I found these images now, like I went to a dollar tree and they had made like hanging Halloween plastic figures and they uh -huh. were those and uh -huh. i'm like how did they get away with this I, the, the fan art for this show you uh i don't know if you've actually seen uh my book yet but i haven't had a chance to read through it no bear manor media there you go <laughs> and it's also available on uh amazon awesome but the reason i bring it up is that there's a section who is that handsome guy? Look at that. A nice haircut. I bet he writes a good book. <laughs> yeah, I think he did. I think he did. Um, but there's a section in here on fan art and merchandise that just popped up out of the woodwork from fans who who love the uh, some good storyboards in here, too. Oh, that's so neat. Yeah, I'm going to have to get this book. But uh, the part I wanted to <laughs> the memes. show you. Just some phenomenal, oh, wow. phenomenal art. Uh, I've seen that amazing. poster. That yeah. those are beautiful, aren't they? Unbelievable stuff. Uh, gorgeous. And fans making like candles and the tiki's <laughs> things. And there's the figure. Uh, I yeah, that's the one that you had. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> the Ellie's robot. <laughs> the robot. <laughs> God, I that mean, has to be Readful Thanes. He does stuff like that all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope I gave him credit. I did. <laughs> I did tell people that if it got included in here, and we, Adam Parochi did the uh, action figures. Oh wow, Adam Parochi is. Responsible oh, that's yeah, that. Readful Thanes. Yep, I see it at the top. Ah, uh, okay, that's fantastic. Uh, but endless fan art. It just just, just keeps going. Floors me. It just started out. I think the first piece, you know, just fans love Tommy. Look at that. Yep. Uh, That's great. It started out. Oh, this is a good one. Oh, it's broken. That's so. And, and in the broken part, there's little gears and things. Oh, man. That's that amazing? so cool. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to show you the 
Oh, it got really abstract, kind of artistic stuff going, you know. So neat. Yeah. (laughs) That that was early. Somebody was inspired and did that. Uh, First, I like the duffel bag too. (laughs) Yeah, the duffel bag. There's a a the crew mug, uh, Uh. which I've run out of long ago. A fan just came up to me at the last show. He reproduced this crew mug. (laughs) Uh, and gave me a handful. And that one right there is the first piece of fan art I saw. Oh. I brought me that at way several years ago. Oh, that's so that neat. The beginning of that. Anyway. Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I've kept you over by a lot, but I, Tommy, thank you so much. This has just been a joy. I can't wait to see you again in September. I'm going to be at age 45. Good, good, good. Yeah, I hope you'll come over. And I uh, totally will, man. It, we'll it's been a joy. A but thank you so much for taking the time for this. I, I hope you love this episode that we're putting together. And um, again, thank you will, so much. Will you send a win the link? You got it. You've got thank it. You. Thank you. Good. No okay. worries. Thank you, man. And and now you've made me spend money because now I'm going to have to go to Trick or Treat's page and and give you some money, probably, hopefully, too, on that. Hopefully hopefully I'll get a nickel or something. Get a nickel. (laughs) Thank you again. And uh, you have a great rest of your week, man. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. It's been a pleasure.